So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled Introduction to Cultural Studies. Uh, we just beginning to wind up this particular course and we've just done a series of texts and our last lecture was a summary of the texts that we have covered so far. So what we'll do in this lecture, we'll revisit <clears throat> something we've done in the beginning of this course. we we'll revisit the understanding of culture. Uh, we'll revisit the entire discipline of cultural studies a little bit uh, and then proceed forward with the uh, remaining texts that we have in this course. <clears throat> and as part of this revisiting uh, plan, we have selected Dick Hebdige's uh, subculture, the meaning of style. Uh, this particular text uh, written by uh, Hebdige is one of the seminal texts in cultural studies, I mean not least because it really situates cultural studies as a discipline. Uh, it talks about how um, cultural studies emerge as a discipline uh, in the humanities and different universities in Britain and other parts of the world. And also it talks about some of the uh, foundational fundamental things that inform cultural studies, something which we have uh, covered to some extent at the beginning of this course. So it's a good, it's a good way to revisit what we started off with uh, and then sort of connect the, the text we have covered so far in terms of this particular, uh, you know, <clears throat> narrative. So subculture, uh, the meaning of style by Dick uh, Hebdige, it draws on a series of uh, writers, thinkers, uh, uh, poets, uh, so it draws on Eliot's understanding of culture, it draws on Willa Barth's understanding of culture, it draws on uh, Arnold's, Matthew Arnold's uh, understanding of culture and then of course it, uh, it mentions and heavily uh, draws on Raymond Williams uh, you know, figures which we have covered uh, already. Uh, so you know it's a very important book uh, for our purpose because what it does is it talks about culture, it tries to attempt, it attempts to define culture as a very uh, complex category. And we've seen how culture always constantly uh, emerges as a very complex phenomenon. There's a phenomenal quality about culture. There's an experiential quality about culture. And of course, there is a textual quality about culture. So there's textuality, phenomenality, uh, experientiality. So these are all things which are invested uh, in, in varying degrees to what we call and what constitutes culture. And um, of course, any serious study of culture, culture studies must take into account uh, these categories, these components. And Hedridge's book, uh, Subculture, The Meaning of Style, uh, is a very important book because it talks about the different narrative formations uh, that inform culture and subculture. Uh, obviously, subculture is a, uh, you know, a category inside culture. So, you know, uh, any, any particular culture has a hegemonic representation, it has a non-hegemonic representation, it has uh, a sub-category, a sub-narrative, it has a dominant narrative. So subculture is about the uh, different micro-narratives which uh, inform and are um, invested into the formation and reformation of any particular culture. So to some extent, this is a theoretical book. Uh, it's, it lays out a theory of cultural studies. But also, uh, it's, it's a very important book historically because it talks about the historical inception and emergence and consolidation of cultural studies as a discipline. Uh, in Britain, in America, and in different parts of the world subsequently. So this is a book that we uh, must uh, sort of study and examine quite carefully. And for the purpose of this particular course, we will look at the introduction of this book uh, very carefully. We'll do it line by line, if possible. Uh, and in a way, like I said, it's a revisiting of something that we have uh, already done at the beginning of this course. But I think at this point, such a revisiting, uh, is such a return is important because it will help us to situate what we have uh, covered already so far and obviously it will lead us forward in terms of uh, looking at the text to come and to wind up this course uh, conclusively. Okay, so Subculture by Dick Hebdige, as you can see, it's got a very provocative, uh, uh, you know, cover page and uh, it's, it's, it's called the meaning, it's the subtitle of this book is a meaning of style and obviously style becomes a very important uh, phenomenon uh, for Hebdige in terms of culture because related to style is the idea of representation, is the uh, politics of representation. Uh, how is culture represented? What are the stylistic categories that are invested in such representations? And obviously style then becomes quite political and quite discursive in quality because uh, style is obviously quite selective, it's uh, heavily uh, political, it's heavily uh, biased. Uh, so this biased, selective quality of style is something that Hebdige uh, constantly uh, draws attention to and um, sort of highlights. Now, 
the introduction is what we will do for the purpose of this course. So chapter one actually is what we will do for the purpose of this particular course. We'll do it line by line. We'll study it extensively uh, because I think it's very important uh, as a historical uh, study because it situates cultural studies, as I mentioned, as a, as a genre, as a subgenre in humanities and how that came into being and what were the historical investments prior to that which sort of may have formed culture studies as a discipline. Now this chapter one is subtitled uh, from culture to hegemony. So what is hegemony? Obviously we know hegemony is a dominant narrative of any particular culture, sort of any culture. Uh, it's a form of domination, it's a form of control, it's a form of uh, representation which gets more uh, visible. It's something which is uh, the most dominant form of representation, whether it's in a cultural category, whether it's in a linguistic category, or you know, in any category. So hegemony is a very important term in cultural studies. It means domination, it means dominant representation, it means uh, sort of higher visibility, etc. It means uh, sort of a grand narrative, if you will, uh, in any particular narrative uh, frame in any particular narrative system. Okay, so culture and then we have a series of definitions of culture and this is something which we have already done. Obviously, we have drawn Raymond Williams at the beginning of this course. So, it's a nice way to sort of revisit and rewind uh, and rehearse something we have covered at the beginning of this course at this point in the course when we are winding up. So, what are the definitions of culture? What are the different uh, categories of culture that, um, you know, the different ways, the different synonyms of culture that may be uh, taken up uh, from an ordinary dictionary visit. So the Oxford English Dictionary, OED, uh, defines culture uh, in terms of these categories and subcategories. So culture, cultivation, tending and Christian authors worship the action or practice of cultivating the soil, tillage, husbandry, the cultivation or, or rearing of certain animals, example fish, the artificial development of microscopic organisms, organisms so produced, the cultivating or development of the mind, faculties, manners, improvement or refinement by education and training, the condition of being trained or re refined, the intellectual side of civilization, the, the, the prosecution of special attention or study of any subject or pursuit. So we have a range of synonyms for culture and we, as you can see I mean these ranges are sometimes quite these synonyms are sometimes quite different from each other so for instance when you think of culture as an act of um, cultivation so cultivation is again a very loaded term so a person can be cultivated culturally and we can also cultivate the soil you can also uh, rare the soil in a way that becomes conducive to uh, production conducive to agriculture uh, and likewise, cultivation could also be applied for animals, cultivation or rearing of certain animals. So, for example, fish, uh, you cultivate fish, you rare certain kinds of fish. And of course, there's an artificiality about culture, which is highlighted in this definition as well. The artificial development of microscopic organisms, bacteria, for instance, uh, you know, organisms so produced. So the artificiality of culture, the naturalness of cultures, all these things come together in this seemingly random uh, range of synonyms that are used to define culture. Uh, so uh, what is quite obvious at the very beginning, and this is quite deliberately designed by Hebditch at the beginning of this chapter, is how culture can become a very complex phenomenon. It can be cultivation, it can be civilization, it can be intellectualization, so you intellectualize yourself through culture. Uh, you um, sort of internalize culture and in the process of internalization there could be mobility, there could be agency, there could be upliftment, uh, etc. So the prosecution of special attention, uh, of study uh, of any particular of any subject or pursuit. So you can have culture can be used as a synonym for a systematic study of any particular category of knowledge. Um, you know, it can also be uh, the condition of being refined or trained. It can be the intellectual side of civilization. So you know, it could be intellectual side of civilization as well as rearing fish. So in a way, it's a very complex and almost. Uh, impossible definition if you look at these range of synonyms. But what is clear uh, from the seemingly random range of references and synonyms that Hebditch is offering us from the OED is that there is an artificial quality about culture that you can artificially rear something, construct something, you know, uh, create something. There's also uh, a natural side of culture, something that happens automatically uh, through processes of internalization. So again, we are back to one of those words which uh, I have been trying to use since the very inception of this course, an entanglement. An entanglement of artificiality and naturalness, an entanglement of materiality and uh, abstraction. So if you look at these definitions on your screen, 
you'll find that there are some very material things about culture as well. So for instance, if you're talking about the soil, if you're talking about fish, if you're talking about animals, if you're talking about uh, language, um, you know, microscopic organisms, these are very material things. But at the same time, if you're looking at culture at the level of ideas, uh, as, as an ideational category, then obviously the abstract quality of culture becomes highlighted. So again, we're looking at entanglement of abstraction and materiality, which is what we've been talking about since the very beginning of this course. Okay, so having given you uh, this um, range of random um, synonyms from Oxford English Dictionary, Hebditch uh, very quickly claims that culture is a notoriously ambiguous concept as the above definition demonstrates. So the ambiguity of culture, the conceptual ambiguity of culture is something that is uh, immediately uh, evident uh, in the series of uh, synonyms that Hebdish offers us, right? So it's a very ambiguous complex category which is sometimes notoriously difficult to define. Uh, the above definition demonstrates that difficulty or impossibility. Refracted through uh, centuries of usage, the word has acquired a number of quite different, often contradictory meanings. Uh, so the word refracted is very useful away, yeah, because uh, what is refraction? If you remember you, uh, your physics, your optics, uh, physics, uh, and back in the school days, you find refraction is what happens when light travels from one medium to another medium. And then there's a change in direction. There's a change, there's a shift in the in the direction of light. So refraction is a little different from reflection, uh, because refraction also entails a change, uh, entails a certain transition uh, from one medium to another medium, right? So culture can be used, can be seen as a refraction uh, through centuries of usage, and each century can be seen as a medium. And from one century to another century, uh, culture travels. And every time it travels uh, across uh, time, across uh, different spaces, the spatial temporal matrix, uh, you find there's a certain change of culture that happens all the time. And we've seen already how, in this particular course, how uh, changeability or mutability become uh, very fundamental categories of culture, right? So, refracted with centuries of usage, the word has acquired a number of quite different, often contradictory meanings. Even as a scientific term, it refers both to a process of process artificial development of microscopic organism and a product organisms so produce. So culture can be seen as a process as well as a product. Uh, this is something again we have touched upon already in this course, but it's important the Hebdige is defining culture in terms of these contradictions, in terms of these complexities. It is a process of acquiring something, but it's, at the same time it's also a product of having acquired that. So when I say someone is a cultured person, or, or this is uh, X culture or Y culture, we are looking at culture as a product, uh, as something which has happened, something which is uh, materially present, palpable, uh, palpably present and, and visible, and it can be sort of uh, defined, can be quantified and calibrated. Uh, but when you're looking at culture as a process of becoming, when you become cultured, you know, uh, culture is a process of acquiring something, a process of appropriation, misappropriation, uh, etc., then it becomes uh, a constant movement. So this, this, this uh, movement between movement and uh, uh, a monument is something which defines culture. So culture is both a monument as well as a, a movement. It's something which uh, is a process as well as a product, and that's something that Hebdige is uh, quite clearly highlighting at the very beginning of this book. Okay, so uh, as it goes on to say, more specifically, since the end of the uh, 18th century, it has been used by English intellectuals and literary figures to focus critical attention on a whole range of, co of controversial issues. So, um, so the end of the 18th century is something that Hebdige defines as the starting point of the systematization of culture and you know what culminated into becoming cultural studies. So uh, the end of the 18th century is where uh, that process of you know, becoming culture, a culture as a category, began to become, uh, began to acquire some currency in popular usage. It was used, it has been used by the English intellectuals and literary figures to focus critical attention uh, on the whole range of controversial issues. So again, range becomes a very important phenomenon. And culture, it can be talked about, it can be used to talk about almost everything under the sun. It can be uh, talked about uh, it can be used, it can be drawn on while talking about Shakespeare, but at the same time it can also be uh, used to talk about a certain culinary tradition, uh, how to cook a certain kind of food, how to cook a certain kind of fish. So both will come under the purview of culture, uh, a study of Hamlet uh, as well as a study of cooking a certain kind of fish can co both come under the purview of culture and cultural studies. So it can be controversial, it can take up certain provocative issues, but what defines culture is a range 
So almost everything is cultural. You can't have anything which is outside of the radar of culture. So you know everything that is talked about, everything that people engage with in the daily conversations, in the daily discourses of life, and in intellectual pursuits, they all come under uh, culture. So in that sense, um, cultural studies can be seen as a study of everything, right? And that's one of the uh, difficulties as well as the complexities of uh, this particular sub-discipline, if you will. So the quality of life, the effects in human terms of mechanization, the division of labor and the creation of a mass society have all been discussed within the larger confines of what Raymond Williams has called the culture and society debate. Uh, so we have already studied Raymond Williams, uh, we have drawn on this book and we've seen how Williams is obviously one of the uh, uh, seminal figures in cultural studies, but the point that Hebdige is making over here is, you know, it, it has this entire range of um, uh, attention and uh, entire range of pursuits, quality of life, the effects on human terms of mechanization, uh, division of labor, uh, mass society, um, so all these things come under uh, culture and cultures and studies and culture and society. It was through this tradition of dissent and criticism that the dream of the organic society um, of society as an integrated, meaningful whole was largely kept alive. Now, this entire idea of an organic culture, an integrated culture, as a culture which is healthy and robust and, uh, you know, will stay together uh, as an integrated whole is something which was an 18th century uh, phenomenon, an 18th century imaginary. So when you see someone like uh, Matthew Arnold, for instance, he talks about how culture constitutes what is best in society. Um, so culture is what is best, what is most intellectual, what is most civilized. And that's what keeps us alive, uh, according to uh, Arnold. This Arnold way of looking at culture is that. The dream had two basic trajectories. Uh, one led back to the past and to the feudal idea of a hierarchically ordered community. Here, culture assumed uh, an almost sacred function. Its harmonious perfection was posited against the wasteland of contemporary life. So the Arnoldian way of looking at culture is a very nostalgic one. It sort of goes back to the past and it uh, resurrects certain hierarchically defined traditions um, in terms of the, the sacrality of those traditions, in terms of the uh, holistic quality of those traditions, etc. Those became uh, very, very important uh, in the Arnoldian way of looking at culture. So culture becomes uh, only uh, an act of harmonious perfection uh, and is posited against the wasteland of contemporary life. So, Culture as a nostalgic category, culture as a memory function is something which is uh, very prevalent even today. So people talk about loss of culture, people talk about uh, the glorious days of culture which are now going away. So a very common narrative that you find in popular conversations about culture is uh, a nostalgic looking back at a rich cultural tradition which is now gone. And that's a function, that's a, a narrative, a micro-narrative, a sub-narrative, if you will, which keeps coming up in, in almost all kinds of discourses, whether it's intellectual discourses, where people talk about how great uh, Shakespeare and Milton were, and we don't have any poets of that tradition, whether it's um, common questions, common conversations, such as people talk about how in their generation there were great batsmen and cricket, and now, you know, that kind of batting style is going out of fashion. Now we have a different kind of batting style, which is one culture. So, you know, whether it's cricket or Shakespeare, batting style or uh, verse writing, uh, this nostalgic function of culture is something which is very prevalent. And that, that sort of Hebditch uh, traces back to this Arnoldian tradition of looking at culture as a harmonious perfection. It used to be harmonious and perfect, uh, and perfect and holistic and healthy at one point in time, but now uh, exposed to the wasteland of contemporary life. It has died a natural death, and now it is of a job as intellectuals so resurrected. That's, this is our Arnoldian way of looking at culture, and the same is true for almost every age uh, that we live in since then. That's one narrative, that's one trajectory of culture that Hebdige defines. The other trajectory, uh, less heavily supported, le led towards the future, to a socialist utopia, while the distinction between labor and leisure was to be annulled. So this is a more uh, Marxist, a more socialist way of looking at culture, and this is mm, obviously less heavily supported. Uh, the more hegemonic uh, narrative of culture is a nostalgic uh, narrative, uh, the narrative of nostalgia, where we look back at those days of richness and health and fruitfulness, uh, you know, uh, abundance and fecundity, and that abundance and fecundity uh, depends on the past, is a paradise lost. And our culture is seen as an act of resurrection, as an act of reconstruction of a lost paradise. This is the Arnoldian first narrative of culture. The second narrative of culture that Hebditch defines over here is a less popular one, and that looks towards the future. Uh, it looks forward 
towards the future, towards socialist utopia, where the distinction between labor and leisure was to be annulled. And this is a very utopian kind of a forward-looking uh, view of culture, vision of culture. The two basic definitions of culture emerged from this tradition, though these were by no means necessarily congruent with the two trajectories outlined above. The first, the one which is probably most familiar to the reader, was essentially classical and conservative. Uh, it represented culture as a standard of aesthetic excellence, the best that has been thought and said in the world, and it derived from an appreciation of classic aesthetic form, opera, uh, ballet, drama, literature, art. The second, traced back to Williams, to Herder, and the 18th century, uh, was rooted in anthropology. Uh, so, one way of looking at culture is obviously the Arnoldian way, which is uh, a culture as an act of excellence, as a system of excellence and perfection, which is quite conservative in quality, that kind of narrative. And the entire idea of culture becomes a backward-looking, nostalgic narrative, as I mentioned, a narrative which wants to recover and retrieve uh, aesthetic excellence, the best that has been said and done in the world, uh, thought and said in the world, these are Arnold's words, uh, and um, it's an appreciation of classic aesthetic form, opera, ballet, drama, literature, art. So th there's a timeless quality about this kind of culture, there's a classical quality about this kind of cultural uh, narrative, a cultural uh, perspective. The second perspective, which is more uh, Marxist, more socialist, uh, it is rooted in anthropology. It is more sort of uh, obsessed, more uh, engaged in a constructive quality of culture. Here, the term culture refers to uh, this is Williams' definition that Hebdige is offering us. Uh, culture refers to a particular way of life which express, expresses certain meanings and values not only in art and learning but also in institutions and ordinary behavior. Uh, the analysis of culture from such a definition is the clarification of the meanings and values implicit and explicit in a particular way of life, a particular culture. So you can immediately see by now, I and mean, this is the reason why I chose this particular text at this point of time in this course, that in a, by this time well, we should be able to, to demarcate or map out the differences between these two narratives. So one narrative is out of timelessness, one narrative is out of timeless excellence. So you know it talks about how uh, opera, ballet, uh, Shakespeare, great literature are great canonical works which will never go out of fashion. These are timeless cultural um, components. The other category of culture, which is a more uh, Williams uh, socialist category of culture, is more anthropological in quality, which talks about not just uh, great art and learning, but also in, in, in ordinary behavior. How culture is, you know, constitutes ordinary behavior, ordinary daily discourses, and this dailiness, this ordinariness. Um, this is what uh, this particular perspective, this particular narrative is more engaged with. Uh, the analysis of culture from such a definition is a clarification of the meanings and values implicit and explicit in a particular way of life, in a particular culture. So the word particular way uh, is important and records. It appears twice in the space of uh, really four words. And someone like Williams, when he uses the word particular twice in such a short space, obviously he's trying to communicate or convey a certain sense of the, uh, the, the local quality of culture, the topical quality of culture, a particular way of life, particular culture, this particularity, the topicality, uh, the local quality is what uh, Arnold, uh, what, what Williams is, is interested in. So the Arnoldian tradition is classical, aesthetic, conservative, nostalgic. The Williams uh, perspective of culture is forward-looking, uh, textual, uh, anthropological, uh, particular, local, etc. And it's more uh, engaged with the ordinariness of culture, it's more engaged with the ordinary quality of culture, which it sees as more interesting uh, as, a, as compared to the classical conservative way of looking at culture. So you know, these are two kinds of narratives that Hebdige is uh, defining. Uh, in, in, in very interesting sense. And this is one of the reasons why uh, this particular book, Subculture, is such an important book for us in cultural studies because it talks about the different ways in which we can look at culture, the different uh, perspectives uh, which we can use to examine culture and what constitutes culture. Uh, and it becomes a very seminal text uh, in, that, in that sense, this particular book. Okay, this definition, the Williams definition, obviously had a much broader range. It encompasses in T.S. Eliot's words, um, this, these are Eliot's words, the heritage is coating, and this should be on the screen. All the characteristic activities and interests of a people, Derby Day, uh, Henley Regatta, Coes, the 12th of August, a cup final, the dog races, the pin table, the dart board, uh, Wensleydale cheese, boiled cabbage cut into sections, beetroot and vinegar, 19th century Gothic churches, the music of Edgar. 
So again, these are random references to different kinds of social phenomena, cultural phenomena, but what Eliot is trying to convey to us uh, in this uh, seemingly random range, this random collage of components, is uh, the randomness of culture, the collage quality of culture, how culture brings together all different kinds of things, whether this is a dog race, or 19th century Gothic architecture, or how to cut cabbage, uh, how to boil cabbage and cut into certain sections, uh, or the music of Edgar, uh, Elgar, sorry. Uh, so, you know, everything comes under the purview of culture, and this is more, uh, this is more akin, this is more related to what Raymond Williams uh, defined culture as, the topical, the ordinary, the daily, and not just the aesthetic and the classical and the conservative and the timeless and the ancient and the nostalgic, but also what's happening now, uh, the nowness of culture, the, this, the contemporaneity of culture, the contemporary quality of culture, what is happening now, uh, the way uh, activities operate. So culture can be seen as a narrative of activities, an act activity-based narrative, not just as a, an institution, not just as a consolidation, a conservative consolidation, which keeps looking back at the past, but also an activity-based phenomenon, a phenomena, um, because it brings together different orders of activities. Okay, so as Williams noted, such a definition can only be supported if a new theoretical initiative was taken. So now we're beginning to see how cultural studies came into being, and this need, this uh, understanding of a new narrative, a new theory, um, you know, uh, to require a new theory, to formulate a new theory, that was something which was, uh, you know, uh, understood by uh, Williams. And Williams, I mean, this is the beginning of the systematization of cultural studies as a discipline or as a subdiscipline in humanities. So there's a requirement, there's an urgent need for a new theoretical initiative. The theory of culture now involved the study of relationships between elements in the whole way of life. And the emphasis shifted from uh, immutable to historical criteria, from fixity to transformation. So again, uh, it's the basic definition, the fundamental definition uh, of culture uh, and the difference that it has from the unordered way of culture as uh, used by uh, Williams is the historicization of culture. So everything should be historicized, everything should be topicalized. So every phenomena, every phenomenon uh, becomes historicized according to, according to Raymond Williams. And this uh, historicization also underlines the ordinariness, the dailiness. Uh, the daily discursiveness, uh, discursivity of culture. It's something which is happening now, and you know, there's nothing sacral about culture. The sacrality that is um, embedded in our northern way of looking at culture as a, a grand narrative of aesthetics and art and fine thinking, that sacrality is taken away, is done away with um, uh, from in, in a Williams way of looking at culture, and which is uh, which sees a shift from the immutable, immutable quality to a historical quality, from fixity to transformation. Right? And that's something that Hebdige is quite clearly uh, mapping out for us here. So uh, this is what William says, and William is quoted by Hebdige over here. An emphasis which, from studying particular meanings and values, seeks not so much to compare these uh, as a way of establishing a scale, but by studying their modes of change, discover certain general causes or trends by which social and cultural developments as a whole can be better understood. So the general causes or trends. So trends become very important over here. Trends become a micro category in culture, right? So we talk about certain trends. So trends have a uh, temporal quality, trends end. Uh, trends begin and end at some points of time. Trends are finite, uh, temporally speaking. But uh, we can look at trends as a subcultural category, as a microcultural category, and how these microcultural or subcultural categories are invested uh, into an understanding of culture as a whole, right? So the wholeness of culture depends and relies on these microcultural activities, which constitute and um, include trends. Right, so this is something that Williams is highlighting, and again we're looking at this local, micro, historical, uh, textual, anthropological way of looking at culture as a daily narrative, as an ordinary narrative, not just a grand narrative of aesthetics and art and uh, classics, which is an unordinary way of looking at culture, but this is a more socialist way of looking at culture. And more important, this is forward-looking. This looks ahead and for in, the, in the future. It has a utopian quality about it as well. As Hebdige says, you know, in an ideal cultural condition, according to Williams, the difference between leisure uh, and work will, you know, will go away, will disappear uh, in due course. So Williams was then proposing an altogether broader formulation of the relationships between culture and society, one which, through the analysis of particular meanings and values, 
sought to uncover the concealed fundamentals of history, the general causes and broad social trends which lie behind the manifest appearances of an everyday life. So again, uh, what Williams is interested in is uh, the structures which inform everyday life. And, and very quickly we'll see how this kind of an, um, engagement with structure uh, will then move into structuralism. And then, you know, Hebdige will talk about Paul Labat and Barth's idea of structuralism uh, in which uh, he looks at culture as different kinds of structural activities, uh, whether it's about uh, frying chips, whether it's reading Balzac, whether it's uh, reading prose, or watching certain kinds of cinema, or, or driving some kind of motor car. So th these all become different kinds of structural activities which are connected to broader structural um, activities. So, uh, you know, it's all a very structuralist process. And so one very good way of looking at culture is through the lens of structuralism, through the prism of structuralism. Uh, and, you know, the analysis of particular meanings and values sought to uncover the concealed fundamentals of history, the general causes and broad social trends which lie behind the manifest appearances of everyday life. You know, so the appearance of everyday life is something which is uh, studied and examined by this very uh, textual understanding of culture. Now, Hebdige will then move on uh, to talk about how cultural studies came into being as a discipline, uh, how it began to emerge in universities uh, as a different kinds of, uh, as, as a subcategory inside the humanities, and how that, that flourish uh, in the hands of Williams, uh, you know, uh, other seminal thinkers, and how it drew on different kinds of disciplines, including structuralism, uh, including, um, you know, gender studies, including different kinds of um, other disciplines such as psychology. And we've seen in the very beginning of this course how uh, one can't do cultural studies unless you're drawing on these disciplines all the time, psychology, philosophy, uh, gender studies, linguistics to a certain extent, uh, and obviously literary studies, which we have used already. Okay, so this is a point where Hebdige talks about the beginning, the birth of cultural studies as a discipline inside the academic space. And that's something, that's a point, that's a discussion that we'll start off with in the next lecture. Uh, but with this, we end the first lecture on this particular book by Dick Hebdige. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Thank you.